um, should I call him first? Yeah, just say hi and then just be like, I'm gonna give an introduction and then you can go ahead. Oh my god, he's calling. <laughs> wait, he's calling on my thing. Wait, why is he doing my thing? Oh, here, oh my god. Oh my god. Okay, wait. <laughs> okay, wait. Hi. Hello. Hi. Oh, wait, sorry. Do you have your uh, webcam on? I was just wondering. Uh, no, hold on. <laughs> wait, let's see. Wait, can you see us? Can you see me now? Yes. yes. Hey. Hi, we have a whole room full of people here. Hi. Hello. Here we go. <laughs> we have a How's it going out there? Yeah. It's great. We have a little like amateur setup. So Yeah. Um I'm not sure if it's working, but am I are we too close? Yeah, me too. I'm just on my iPhone. <laughs> see that's smart. We should have that. Okay, perfect. Uh Um, so I'll, I'll just give like a quick introduction basically. I'm very excited to introduce Mr. Tom Mueller who is the co-founder and chief technology officer of propulsion at SpaceX. He's the champion of the Occupy's Mars movement, which I am proudly representing, I'm much <laughs> hurt, um, and the brains behind SpaceX's rocket designs. As one of the world's foremost rocket engine designers, he is responsible for developing propulsion systems and engines for both the Falcon launch vehicles and the Dragon spacecraft and much more obviously. Um, before we start, I just want to say thank you from all of us for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk with us. We are all very amazed with the work you do at SpaceX, and congratulations on all the success you guys have been having with the recent launches. Oh, thank you. Sweet. So, uh, basically, you can take it away. <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> do you have anything? If Did everybody see that launch yesterday? Uh, yeah, I watched the launch today. Anyone else the launch yesterday? Yeah. Yeah. Morning. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Saw it on Reddit. Saw it on Reddit. Okay, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, if you want, if you have like a talk prepared and we have some questions at the end. Okay. Sweet. So I'm going to talk about, um, you know, low cost access to space. Um, when I was a kid, you know, I used to, in the 60s, I used to watch Star Trek. And I was eight years old and they landed on the moon. And of course, like I think like a lot of us, we thought, you know, 50 years from now we'll be on Mars, we'll be traveling maybe to, you know, other planets, have more of a Star Trek-like experience. And, you know, it didn't really happen, did it? Right. Um, you know, the, the invention of modern rocketry uh, until they put a man on the moon was about 40 years, from Goddard to, uh, to Armstrong. And, you know, it's been over 50 years since then, and it seems like we haven't really uh, achieved all that much. Um, in fact, we no longer have the ability to put a man on the moon right now. We don't have the hardware. Um, so why is that? And I think one of the big reasons is it's still prohibitively expensive to get to orbit. Um, and why is that? Um, it's because rockets are very expensive. Um, the mass of a rocket is about 95% propellant by weight uh, of a Falcon 9 rocket. Um, so is it, the, is it the propellant that's expensive? No, actually it's not. It's, it's less than uh, a half a percent of the total cost of the rocket is the propellant. Um, it's, the, it's the structure of the rocket and the engines that is very expensive. And the problem is we throw these rockets away until very recently that was just the, the way that you that you thought about rockets is they're expendable because they're originally developed as intercontinental ballistic missiles and of course that's not reusable so nobody ever really thought to make them reusable and so it's one of the it's the only form of transportation i can think of where people don't think of it as being reasonable, they just think of it as expendable. Like, can you think of anything else that you would uh, you throw away after one use? That you know, a, a form of transportation. The only thing I could ever come up with that's sort of like that is like a top fuel dragster. They make one run down the quarter mile, and then they have to rebuild the engine. And when you when you design that way, you can do incredible things. Those those cars do 
you know, a quarter mile in less than four seconds, and they're doing, you know, over 300 miles an hour at the end of a quarter mile, or actually a thousand feet now they run. So it's pretty incredible when you build something, uh, you know, you design it for single use, you can really push the, 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 uh, the, the bounds of engineering and get incredible performance. And that's true with rockets. Um, if you make a rocket reusable, you have to give up some of its performance, just like your family car can be used tens of thousands of times and drive hundreds of thousands of miles, and it doesn't have near the performance of a top fuel dragster, but you know it's affordable and it's very useful. So we got to find something in between, something where we have close to the performance of a top fuel dragster, but somewhat closer to the uh, the reuse and um, in utility of like a household car. So what we need to do is um, is design rockets to be reusable. So that's what we set out to do. And first of all, you gotta make the rockets, you know, relatively low cost. If, if your rocket costs a billion dollars, even if you use it a hundred times, it's still gonna be very expensive to use. So we set out to build low cost rockets right from the beginning. That the, the the cost that the government cost plus programs charge for their rockets is, is just ridiculous. We don't compare our costs to any space vendors, uh, any government subsidized uh, space vendors, because it, it's just, it's not a good starting point. What we try to do is compare our costs to commercial products, like even airliners um, are kind of expensive for our cost trades. So. Uh, I always get from Elon. I always get the, you know, you know how much it costs to make a Model S uh, Tesla. <laughs> Start from there, and work my way up to the box. Like here's a, here's a here's a conversation I had maybe about five years ago on the, on a Merlin One uh, D when we first developed it. He asked me. He said, uh, "How much do you think it costs to make a Model S?" And I'm like, I don't know, fifty thousand dollars? He said, No, about thirty thousand dollars is a marginal cost to produce that car. And he goes, How much does that car weigh? And I said, About five thousand pounds. Right, about five thousand pounds. He goes, How much does a Merlin engine weigh? And I go, uh, about a thousand pounds. <laughs> and so he's like, So why the heck does it cost, you know, some fraction of a million dollars to make a Merlin engine? And, I mean, he has a good point. So he said, I'll give you, it's the materials that you use are not aluminum, they're not stamped, so I'll give you a factor of five. So it's equivalent to a Model S, it's, you know, it's equivalent to, say, 5,000 pounds of rocket engine. So why is it, you know, 20 times the cost? So that's the, kind of the way that, that we look at it and the, and the way we think at SpaceX, trying to get the amortization cost uh, of the rocket down because once you start reusing it, um, then it's really the bit... The, the big costs become the amortization cost of the of, of it and the cost, the operational cost and the fuel cost, which is basically the same model as an airliner. And we looked at that. The airliners are, you know, they're about um, 50% operation costs and I think it's about 20% 25% uh, amortization cost of the, you know, the, the cost of the, um, you know, the $300 million aircraft over its life. And so that's kind of the modeling that we want to do uh, to, to figure out how to make access to space very uh, affordable. So, like I said, we don't use, um, you know, we don't use space. We, have, we avoid space vendors like the plague. Like, when we started developing the Merlin engine, um, you know, I needed valves. I needed liquid oxygen and kerosene valves that had to work. So I went to some of the vendors that supplied these valves and said, hey, can you give me you know, a good price on your existing product? And no, they couldn't. So I said, can you design a much lower cost one? So they came back and said, well, you know, you already know if it takes them like two weeks or a month to give you a quote, you've already got the wrong vendor. Like, <laughs> If it takes them that long to just give you a price, how long does it take them to build the actual part? So they come back with, of thousands of dollars for their part and you know it's gonna take 18 months to develop it and I'm like no I need it like in three months <laughs> and they kind of laugh at you so we ended up developing our own components our own valves uh, pre valves main valves uh, you know we'd already developed the injector and the 
um, the combustion chamber and the main parts of the engine. But we were hoping that we could just go buy some of this other stuff from existing suppliers. And no, the, the cost was just the cost and schedule just uh, wouldn't close for us. So started uh, any anybody that pro provides uh, you know space hardware to uh, government contractors is just uh, not at the performance level we want to be at. So it, that, that's how we get the cost of the of, of the um, hardware down. Also, we had to have control of our own test site, so we we did developed a test site in Texas and did our own testing because a huge cost of the of the uh, of developing and uh, testing rockets is, is the test site cost. So we need to get that under control. Um, in my previous career, when I was at TRW, we ran an engine. It was a fairly, it was a big engine, a 650,000 pound engine, but it was very simple. And we ran it um, at uh, a government uh, test site, a NASA test site in Stennis. And they had a crew of 100 people. Basically, they had two shifts uh, of about with about 100 people, and when we were at, when we ran an equivalent uh, complexity engine, maybe not that size, but a, a, like a 40,000 pound engine at our site, we could run it with like between five and ten people. So that's what I was looking for um, for running even a pump-fed uh, large engine like the Merlin engine. It doesn't take an army of people to, to run an engine like that, and that I think the government. Uh, contractors have convinced themselves it does. Um, when, I, when I first started developing the Merlin engine, the conventional thinking was only only governments can develop rockets. You know, a, a private company can never have the resources. So it was really it was SpaceX that kind of broke the ice on that and said, no, it doesn't take it doesn't take a government to do it. It doesn't take billions of dollars. It takes it, it took us hundreds of millions. <laughs> but it didn't take they didn't take billions uh, to do it. Um, so you got to you got to minimize fuel costs because you know you get the hardware cost down. Now fuel is a major component of your cost. So you get, you have efficient combustion, and, and we build our our injectors are running at about ninety six ninety seven percent combustion efficiency. You really can't get much more out of a rocket injector than that, and and use low cost propellant. We actually picked the wrong propellant. So it, it wasn't too bad, but we picked. Um, uh, RP1 rocket grade kerosene, which at the time was you know eight dollars a gallon. Um, we tried jet fuel, which is more like two dollars a gallon, but it just it just didn't run very good. But very recently, we renegotiated the cost of the kerosene fuel, and I think we got it down closer to jet fuel. But really, what we what we found uh, in more recent studies is that uh, methane, natural gas, is the cheapest form of fossil fuel energy. Um, that's what uh, is mainly what they're, you know, getting rid of coal, getting rid of oil, and running on on natural gas. Um, it's the cheapest uh, fuel that that you can get, and it also has a great property is that it can be made easily on Mars. So that that figures in too. But our next vehicle is going to be all uh, methane fuel. Oxygen is no brainer. Oxygen is so cheap. Um, our our cost for oxygen is about seventy dollars a ton. So it's it's just almost free um, when you consider the cost. It's actually the fuel that ha that's more significant cost. Even though there's more oxygen, there, there's uh, three times as much oxygen uh, on the on the uh, rocket as there is uh, uh, methane, and two and a half times as much oxygen as kerosene. It is uh, by far cheaper because it's just uh, so easy to make from from air from from uh, cooling air. So you get the fuel down. Um, and then you gotta you gotta make the rocket completely reusable, which we're still struggling with. When when that rocket came back like yesterday, you know, it's it's smoking, it's sitting there smoking. We we, we burn a lot of the ablative on it. Um, we have to remove the legs to in order to lower it and then and reinstall them. I mean, it's just it's not a quick turn. It's, what we want is like an aircraft. It pulls in, uh, you know, it pulls into the airport. The people get off. They, they fuel it while the people are getting back on. They do some checks. You know, they do some, some, some inspections, and everything looks good. You go again. That's where we want to get to, and that's um, the Block 5 uh, Falcon uh, rocket that we're rolling out uh, later this year is going to have uh, reusable uh, thermal protection on it so we don't, we don't burn up uh, the heat shielding on it. 
and it's got much better um, landing legs that just fold up and, and just drop the rocket, fold the legs up, ship it, fold them back out uh, when, it, when it lands. So um, making it so it turns very fast so we can fly it. Um, our goal, Elon asked us to do a 12-hour turn. And we came back and said without some major redesigns to the rocket, uh, with just the block five, we can get to a 24-hour turn. And he, he accepted that. All right, 24-hour turn time. And that that doesn't mean that we want to fly that rocket, you know, once a day. Uh, although we could if we really really pushed it. But that, it just it what it does is limits like how much labor, how much touch labor you can put into it. Like if you can turn a rocket in in 24 hours with just a few people, then you you you're not spending a lot, you know, a cost optimal cost basically getting that rocket ready to fly again. So that, those are all the things that we did in order to get, or are doing, in order to get uh, the cost of access to space down. Uh, hopefully by a factor of 100 when we do the Mars vehicle. We, we can't do that right now with the Falcon because we still throw away the upper stage. So maybe, um, you know, almost a third, about 30% of the cost of the rocket is that upper stage. It has, it has a single um, Merlin engine on it, but a fairly sophisticated version of the engine, and also has... You know the guidance computer, um, and you know uh, a lot of electronics on it. So it, you know it's 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 a it's a significant cost with the marginal performance that that gets returned a lot site reusability and throwing being able to throw some of the biggest satellites. We just we just can't make it close with that size rocket to uh, to to recover the, the upper stage. We're gonna we're gonna try. Uh, in the next few years to start recovering the upper stage, but we won't be able to do it for all missions. So that, that'll help uh, reduce the cost quite a bit. But the Mars rocket is meant to be completely reasonable. Both stages, um, gigantic rocket can put hundreds of tons into orbit in a single flight. It can uh, go all the way to Mars and back. You have to fuel it on Mars. We need to make a, about a thousand tons of propellant on Mars over a two year cycle to bring it back. That's a, that's a tall order. You need about half a megawatt that much propellant to bring. But that rocket is going to be the real game changer. The, the I, I would say the um, the Falcon 9 is evolutionary. Um, you know, a reasonable rocket that's that really reduces the, the cost of access to space. Um, maybe we can achieve a 10 uh, reduction in cost over, you know, like what ULA or the Russians or the Chinese are doing with the Falcon, but we want like a hundred or more reduction in cost. And that's what the Mars rocket is going to do. That's going to be the revolutionary rocket. So once we're flying that, um, all other rockets will probably be obsolete. Um, <laughs> luckily, Blue Origin is working on a fully reusable rocket. But, um, you know, we've really changed the industry that the other guys are really scrambling. Um, it's it, it was pretty funny to watch this because when we start first started the company um, 15 years ago, my my, fi my uh, 15 year anniversary was Monday, uh, yesterday May, May 1st. So it's 15, oh, we started the company on May 1st, 2002. Um, well, I started there. I, I consider we, Elon incorporated the company. I think in February, but we, he didn't have any employees yet. So I consider <laughs> when he had his first employee, he had a company. <laughs> um, but anyway, over the you know the 15 years we've gotten you know th this far, and when we when I was first hiring people, um, you know that, that's when I heard you know, that you have enough money to develop this rocket, and then we built the Falcon One, which had a single Merlin engine in it, could throw about a thousand pounds in the low Earth orbit, and they said, okay, you guys were able to build a small rocket, but you'll never build an ELV, like an Air Force uh, mission class rocket. And so we, we built the, the, the Falcon 9 and started flying it. And then, well, you'll never be able to reuse it. You'll never be able to go to the space station. You know, at, at some point, you just, you know, stop listening to it. <laughs> and I think it's great. Uh, you know, it's, uh, w w if people think it's what you're doing is impossible, then you know you're doing the right thing. Like, we still, you know, you can find the YouTube videos online where people are critiquing our are recovering, saying it was it was all uh, basically um, photoshopped or CGI. <laughs> that's that's pretty high praise when people don't actually believe <laughs> what you're doing. So I think I think it's great. And you know we were ridiculed by 
uh, you know, the other big companies in the, in the launch vehicle business, they did, at first they ignored us, and then they fought us, and then they, we found out, they found out, they couldn't, they really couldn't win in a fair fight, because, you know, we were successful, and we were, you know, factors of two or three or perhaps even five lower costs than what they could do. So then it becomes an unfair fight um, where they, they, you know, try to destroy you politically or, you know, using other means. And then at some point they, they figure out that they got to do what you're doing. So there's a lot of talk with these other companies about how they're going to make reasonable, you recover the engines, uh, recover the stages, uh, come up with a, a much lower cost rocket so they can compete. Um, you know, that there's no way that, um, ULA would have considered buying engines from Blue Origin, uh, except for the pressure that SpaceX put on them. Um, there's no way that, that the French would have quickly, uh, abandoned the Ariane 5 and moved to the Ariane 6 design, uh, because of the, except for the pressure that we're putting on them. So we're really changing the world. The Russians are now saying that they're going to come up with a rocket that can, that can beat SpaceX which is uh, entertaining because they've been working on their Angara rocket for 22 years and have launched it once. <laughs> and suddenly they're going to come up with a low-cost one. But anyway, it's great that we're changing uh, the paradigm and, and, and causing everybody else to think differently about how this is done. So once we do it and everybody else starts doing it, uh, then what's going to happen? Um, I think the transport problem has to get solved and then the killer apps in space are going to appear. And we don't know what they are yet. It's like when the internet first came out, people go, what, what good is that? Like people couldn't imagine what you're going to use it for. Um, I think we can imagine a lot of things to use a very low cost uh, rocket for. And the common ones you see are, you know, space tourism, of course, hotels in space. Bigelow has his inflatable hotels and trips around the moon, which we have already got um, people signed up to do that. Uh, resort on the moon, perhaps. Um, certainly Mars, that's what, what we're doing. Uh, look, we're looking to colonize Mars. Space mining, you know, um, uh, metallic asteroids are could, could be worth, you know, trillions of dollars. Um, resources on the moon, there's water on the moon, there's uh, helium-3 on the moon. Of course, we need to get fusion working first, but if we ever do, he helium-3 would be very uh, useful. Um, and of course, m mining metals on the moon. Satellites, uh, bigger constellation satellites with lower cost rockets. There'd be, a, I think there'd be a lot more done in space if the, if the cost comes down by a factor of hundred. You know, less, uh, you know, less uh, running wires on Earth and just transmitting from space, which is what we're doing. I mean, the satellite uh, constellation that we're developing is is basically to put the internet in space. We we want to put eventually equivalent to what is currently the current bandwidth we have on on terrestrial. Uh, like on fiber in in space, so we can basically double the bandwidth of uh, of of, of um, the internet that exists, and it would be everywhere. In fact, it would be better out in the middle of nowhere because you would have the satellites to yourself. If you were like in northern Alaska or middle of Wyoming or you know you know middle of the Sahara Desert, you'd have a great connection mm -hmm. because you'd have all those satellites overhead to yourself. If you're in LA, it's really not going to help that much because you know there's 11 million other people using those satellites, but uh, people out in the middle of nowhere are going to love it. <clears throat> and uh, Google really loved it too. That's why they, they invested about um, uh, $900 million, almost a billion dollars into SpaceX because we can, we can quickly move what they call backbone. About, I think about 70 to 80% of what you pull up on your computer, the information is stored locally. Like, if you're here in LA and you're pulling up some viral video, it's probably stored locally. It's not coming from you know wherever it was you know generated, and that's and moving that that information from city to city and place to place is called backbone. And the example that that I got was if you wanted to move data from LA to South Africa, right now it goes across the U.S. to New York. It jumps across the Atlantic to Europe. It travels down through the Middle East and down through Africa and gets to South Africa. It's a lot of server hops and a lot of latency. It, you know, gigabytes of data to South Africa. 
with our satellite network, it would just be line of sight across, you know, straight to South Africa um, with low latency through laser links between the satellites. So that's what we're working on. Um, and imagine if you had uh, a launch vehicle that can put hundreds of tons of satellites equivalent in a single launch for just a few million dollars. It just it just completely changes the game. Then you start thinking about you know putting big satellites and hundreds of them up there and you know being able to service them. Uh, it, just, it really changes the whole dynamic. So that that's what we're we're working on uh, right now. So. The transport, the transportation comes first. It's just like, um, like developing the Western U.S. You know, they had the covered wagons at first, which got people over here, but they really, you really didn't enable development of the West until they put in the railroad. Now you had, you could move tons of hardware and tons of people for low cost. That's what we need to build is the railroad to space, basically. So that's what we're working on. Is, you know, is is, we're we're just the, we're just the transportation, like. Colonizing Mars, we're, we need a lot of help colonizing Mars. We're, we want to provide basically the airliner ticket to Mars, but somebody else has to provide the, you know, the rental car when you get there, or the, you know, the housing, uh, the food, um, you know, just building up. When Elon says we're going to provide it, you know, uh, easy access to Mars, that means we're going to be able to move you there, but it's going to be up to other companies and other industries to to help make that happen so it's going to be a huge collaboration to, to, to make this really happen um, so I'm really excited about what we're doing we're, we're kind of hitting the limits of uh, chemical rocket um, technology um, the new engines we're developing for the for the Mars ship are very high pressure uh, stage combustion engines um, getting all the energy you can out of fossil fuel propellants. Um, you have 99% combustion efficiency, uh, over 4,000 PSI combustion chamber pressure, full flow. So all of the propellant goes through the main combustor. There's not, there's no, it's not an open cycle, it's a closed cycle. So all of the energy from the propellant is going to thrust. It's basically, you, you can't get any more energy out of uh, a chemical propellant. You can get a little bit more performance if you went to hydrogen and oxygen, but it actually, the rocket gets much bigger and more expensive. So the sweet spot is not hydrogen and oxygen. A lot of people thought about that. I did too. The original Raptor engine was hydrogen and oxygen until I did this, the studies that showed if you use hydrogen and oxygen, the, the rocket is lighter because the propellant's lighter, but the propellant costs more. The propellant is harder to make on uh, on another planet, it takes a lot more energy, and the rockets, even though it's lighter, it's actually bigger. The structure is bigger, and the engines are bigger, so it's it's actually costs more to make it, even though it's carrying less weight. And that you can look at that um, if you if you compare the Delta rocket to the Atlas rocket. The Delta is a hydrogen oxygen booster, and it's it's bigger. It's five meters in diameter compared to the Atlas, which is like three meters in diameter, but it's actually lighter and it, you know, has, it has a smaller, it has a, a 650,000 pound thrust engine on it, whereas the, the Atlas has a 950,000 pound thrust engine. Um, and the Atlas can throw more, can just throw uh, a lot more payload. And you look at a Falcon 9, you know, it's a, it's a small rocket, it's 12 feet in diameter, um, but it can throw a lot, uh, more than a, you know, than a standard Atlas. So um, using a, a high performance, low density propellant is not the answer. So we've gotten everything we're going to get out of uh, chemical propellant. So we're we're looking actually a little bit at um, like we're we're doing electric propulsion for the um, for for the satellites, and we're talking to people about nuclear thermal. Um, you know the um, uh, the NASA centers are working on on nuclear. It's just prohibitively expensive to test because you can't. It's not like the '60s where you can just let fission product fly out of your rocket out into the desert. <laughs> You now got to scrub it and clean it and, and, and capture it, which is uh, super expensive. Um, I don't think SpaceX could really afford to, to develop that rocket ourselves, but if uh, NASA ever gets turned on to, to develop those test stands, we would probably want to jump in on that because you can just about double the, the performance uh, of, a, of a rocket to Mars compared to a, uh, you know, a, 
a really good like a reactor system, a really good chemical system um, with with fission, with nuclear fission. Um, theoretically, fusion maybe ten times better. Antimatter maybe a, a thousand times better. But you know, I think those certainly aren't going to happen in my lifetimes. Hopefully, in your lifetimes. <laughs> Um, yeah, the warp drive's still a long ways away. Or <laughs> <laughs> stuck with chemical propellant for, for quite a while. So that was my ramble. That's about uh, what I wanted to talk about uh, today. So we can open up for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We've collected a few questions. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, our first one is... How far is too far for the rockets? The Mars Colonial Transporter was renamed the Interplanetary Transport System because it was deemed that travel could be made further than Mars. And similarly, do you think deep space travel will ever be possible or are we limited by distance? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, some things are too far. Like, you can't get, you can't get to Mars um, with our system about you know 20 about 24 out of 26 months you cannot get to mars it's on the other side of the sun and it's just you, you want to you want to go to mars when it's coming swinging by the earth you want you want to go when it's you know in miles away not when it's 210 million miles away um we can you know we can obviously go to the outer planets like we have with the planetary probes it's just that the way to do that is using gravitational assist, and it takes years. Um, if we want to go direct to, to Jupiter, we could do it with this system, but we couldn't throw a lot of mass. It'd probably just be, you know, we can we can we can put a hundred tons onto Mars. We can probably put, I don't know, I'm, I'm guessing like twenty tons quickly to Jupiter. Um, so, and it would take much longer. You know, Jupiter is much further than Mars, so. Uh, you just wouldn't be able to do it because, with people because you wouldn't be able to provide, uh, you know, the, the supplies they need, the oxygen and the food and the water and everything. So I think it's the system that we have uh, in work for Mars would not would not work to go directly to the outer planets. But if you had, you know, a system of depots uh, along the way, you could do it. You, you'd have to kind of hop along the way. And I don't think you'd go much further than Jupiter. You know, it's twice as far again to Saturn. So, and and then you know, it's just getting so cold. So, but there's a lot of moons on Jupiter, a lot of surface there. So, I think that would definitely be a place to go. But as far as sending probes, uh, big probes to the outer planets, um, absolutely. You know, we could send huge uh, robotic missions to uh, to the outer planets. And what what I'm waiting for is somebody to start developing these satellites and probes that are uh, you know somebody like spacex to come along and make it affordable like the you know you guys are all into astronomy and i'm sure you're huge fans of the hubble which was a bargain at what, a couple billion or, or, i don't know what was that thing three billion and now there's the the um web the jwst is coming up here launching in a year and a half and eight billion dollars that's not a deal i mean that thing better <laughs> better make it to orbit <laughs> um that could probably be developed for uh, like one tenth that cost so they what we need is a is a spacex type contractor to give the to match our low cost rocket you know i mean we've reduced the cost of access to space by you know a factor of three or four shooting for a factor of ten somebody needs to reduce the the, the cost of access to scientific equipment to match what we're doing so I would love to see that happen SpaceX would love to do that but we're kind of busy <laughs> <laughs> one of our members uh, Mayank Kapoor asks what's it like working for Elon Musk how is he as a boss how is he out of the office <laughs> <laughs> it's really it's it's quite a trip working for Elon um, it's it's different every day <laughs> Because it, it all depends on what mood he's in. Um, like he's been in a great mood lately. You know, we've been very successful, and uh, Tesla's been doing quite well. Um, so it's been good recently. Um, he's still he's extremely demanding, 
One thing I tell people often is, I, I've seen this happen quite a few times in the 15 years that I, I've worked for them. We'll have a, you know, a group of people sitting in a room making a key decision. And everybody in that room will say, you know, basically, we need to turn left. And Elon will say, no, we're going to turn right, you know, to, to, to put it in a metaphor. And that's how, that's how he thinks. He's like, you guys are taking the easy way out. We need to take the hard way. And uh, I've seen that hurt us before. I've seen that, that fail. But I've also seen where nobody thought it would work many times it was the right decision. It was a harder way to do it, but in the end, it was uh, the right thing. One of, the, one, of the, the, one of the things that we did with the Merlin 1D was he kept complaining. I, t I talked earlier about how expensive the engine was, and he said, how, how only way is to get rid of all these valves, because that, that, that's what's really driving the complexity and the cost. And uh, how can you do that? I said, well, on smaller engines, we'd go phase shutoff, but nobody's ever done it on a large engine. This could be really difficult. He goes, we need to do phase shutoff. Explain how that works. So I, I drew it up, kind of did, did some you know, some sketches, and here's what we would do. And he said, that's what we need to do. And I advised him against it. I said, you know, it's just going to be too hard to do. It's not going to save that much. But he made the decision that we're going to go phase shutoff. So we went and developed that engine. It was hard. We blew up a lot of hardware, and, and we tried probably a hundred different combinations to make it work, but we made it work. And uh, I still have the original sketch that I did. I think it was like, was that Christmas 2011 when I did that sketch? And um, I mean, it's changed quite a bit from that original sketch, but uh, it was uh, it was pretty scary for me knowing how that hardware worked. And But, but, but by going phase shut off, we got rid of the main valves. We got rid of um, the sequencing computer. Basically, just you spin the pumps, the pressure comes up, the pressure opens the main injector, lets the oxygen go first, and then the fuel comes in. So all you get at a time is igniter fluid. If you have igniter fluid flowing, that engine's going to light, it's not going to hard start. Um, they got rid of the, the problem we would have where, like, you have two valves, the oxygen valve and the fuel valve. And the oxygen valve is very cold and very stiff. It just doesn't want to move. And it's the one that you want to open first. If you relieve this fuel, it's what's called a hard start. In fact, we have an old saying that says, And by having sequencing correctly, you can get rid of about, you know, 900 of those bad things. So going phase shutoff made it, these engines very reliable, got rid of a lot of mass, and got rid of a lot of cost. And it was the right thing to do. Now we have the lowest cost, most reliable engines in the world. And it was, it was basically because of that decision to, to you know, to go, to go do that. So that, that's, a, you know, one of the examples of... Uh, you know, Elon just really pushing. He always says we need to push to the limits of physics. Like, you know, an example I'll give is um, on the, the car factory. You know, a, a car moves through a typical factory, like a Toyota or a Chevy factory. A car is moving at, you know, inches per second. It's like much less than walking speed. And his thoughts are that the machinery, the, the robots that are building the cars should move at the as fast as they can. They should be moving so fast you can't see them. And he said, that's why you can't have people in there because they just get crushed because people move too slow. <laughs> so that's, that's the way he thinks. It's like, what are the physical limits of how fast you can make a car? And he looks at videos of like Coke cans being made and things like that where you can't even see them. You know, it's just, it's just a blur. And you know, the, 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 the puck of aluminum, you know, you cut it out of a sheet, you, you, you deep draw it, you fill it with coke, you put the lid on, and you put the paint on it. It's just like, <laughs> it's, it's just like going, it's going down the, the assembly line so fast you can't even see it. And he wants to do that with cars. So that, that's just the way he thinks. Nobody else thinks that way. And that's why he's going to kill the industry in, in cars also, because it's, it's just going to make these, these, these cars, basically you can make, you know, 10 times as many cars in, in the same size factor if you do it that way. And, you know, the the major cost of the car is not the material in the car, it's, it's a factory that takes to build the car. So that's that's just the way he thinks. He, he th looks at it from first principles, like, why does a car cost so much to make? Well, you have this gigantic piece of real estate, and all these employees in, in this gigantic building, 
and you can only make you know so many cars in this building. You need to make more cars in the same building with the same number of people, and that's what they're working on at Tesla. So yeah, it's pretty trippy working with Elon. It's been really, <laughs> really, really stressful, but really rewarding too. I'm quite, I'm quite proud of what we've achieved. Um, I've always felt like we were way behind schedule and and way underperforming because we never we never got it in time or we never it's never as good as is is uh, physically possible but it was way better than anybody else could do it and way faster than anybody else could do it so we can be proud of that Fantastic. I wouldn't want I would want to have Elon for a father I think you'd never <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I have a lot of yeah. questions. We have to well, here's a, another question from Paige Colley. She, uh, she says, a common misconception about early rocket science was people didn't understand Newton's lo uh, third law of motion and thought that the rocket fuel needed something to push against. Therefore, a rocket right. couldn't travel through the vacuum of space. Is this still a common misconception? And are there any other common misconceptions like that that you try and educate the public on? Yes. <laughs> it's, but it's funny. We're, you know, we're in a era of disinformation. I mean, you, you can find all kinds of people that say the Earth is flat. And nothing you <laughs> can tell them will convince them that it's not. So there are those people that you just, you don't want to waste your time with them. But, you know, I've seen people say, like, I've seen core answers like, they're still saying that, you know, rocket engines can work in space when it's clearly impossible because they have nothing to push against, which is just, uh, it's so easily provable that <laughs> it's, it's, it's just, you know, it's ridiculous. But think of it this way. Um, this is the way I always explain it to people. If you're, um, you're sitting in a wagon with a bunch of bricks and you pick up a brick and throw it out of the back of the wagon, you know, it'll move you, right? You can move yourself by throwing bricks out of the wagon. So you're not pushing against anything, you're pushing against that brick. But the brick's with you. That's what a rocket engine's doing. I'll give you an example. The Merlin engine, the current version of the, of the Merlin engine, basically throws 800 pounds a second of bricks out the back at about uh, 10,500 feet per second. So, you know, if you're throwing 800, you know, pounds of bricks at Mach 10 out of the back of your wagon, you're going to get a lot of thrust out of it. That's how a rocket engine works. Um, and the way that that you move that mass is you is you convert pressure into velocity. And the way that you convert pressure into velocity is with a nozzle. And you ha the more pressure ratio you can have, which is the bigger nozzle you can have, the more velocity you can get out. So when you're in a vacuum of space, you can basically have as much knowledge as you want because you have infinite pressure ratio. You're only limited by the size of the nozzle you can put on the rocket. So once you're in space, you can actually expand that gas to a higher pressure ratio and get more velocity out of it. So you're moving your bricks faster, basically. So it's, it's actually quite simple to explain how a rocket engine works, but people still think that you need to push against air or something. But no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> the air is just in the way. <laughs> So on Earth, you get it from um, from high purity wells. There's some in Texas, and various states have have high purity um, natural gas wells. And then you actually we we sub we sub cool the methane, so it actually um, will tend to drop out when you do that. The the higher carbon uh, um, compounds drop out. So you want to get rid of the butanes and the propanes and all that stuff in there and just run pure methane. Um, and there's ways to purify it. And uh, on Mars, it's actually quite easy to make. Um, you, all you need is water and CO2. So you, you got to find the ice on Mars, and there, there's lots of there's lots of ice subsurface ice on Mars. There's glaciers that are, as far as I can tell, that are several kilometers thick and you know tens of kilometers long and wide. So if you'd land at one of those sites, um, you would have enough water to, to last a giant city for, for hundreds of years. 
Um, and then the, the Mars atmosphere, even though it's very thin, it's about 95% CO2. So you use multi-stage compression pumps to pump the Mars atmosphere up to something you can work with, like say, you know, three to five uh, atmospheres, you know, three to five bar. And you take the water and you electrolyze it. Um, you basically unburn it. W water is the combustion product of a hydrogen oxygen combustion. So it takes a lot of energy to basically unburn it. It's called electrolysis. So um, about half of the, a little bit more than half of the energy you need to make propellant is just um, is 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 uh, decomposing the water back into hydrogen and oxygen gas. Then there's a lot of energy that's used to um, to liquefy it. There's some used to compress the Mars atmosphere, but most of it is to to unburn the hydrogen and oxygen. So now you have you have oxygen gas very pure and hydrogen gas very pure. The oxygen you liquefy and store in a tank. The hydrogen you react with um, the the CO2 gas. Uh, over a catalyst, and it actually is exothermic at that point. You actually get energy out, um, and you form uh, you form methane and more water. So the water goes back to electrolysis, and then that hydrogen goes back into the you know into the methane reaction, and, and you you take the oxygen and uh, and liquefy it. And if you do that, the the stoichiometry of 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 water and uh, and CO two. Uh, comes out at a mixture ratio oxygen to fuel at about four to one. So for every so for every pound of methane, you get four pounds of oxygen, which is perfect because the the, the rocket engine runs at three point six, three and a half or three point six. So you have excess oxygen which people can breathe, and the rest is used as propellant. So it works out quite nicely uh, to make the the uh, propellant on Mars. Uh, it takes a lot of energy. If you try to do it with solar. It's going to be extremely difficult, but it's doable. Um, to get one ship back, you'd need about eight football fields worth of solar cells on Mars, and you have to keep the dust off them. <laughs> um, so that's tricky. It's much better to use a nuclear reactor, a fission reactor. Uh, you, it's, you know, it's it's more compact. You actually get um, uh, more. Um, you get more power out per pound of reactor than you do out of solar cells, so it's more mass efficient. If you're gonna, if you're going to take it to Mars, it's more it's more efficient to, to ship reactors than it is solar. Um, it's just that nobody's really developed a space reactor yet. We're working with NASA on that. Hopefully, they'll get funding to develop. They have a program called Kilopower going, which is like a 10,000 uh, watt, you know, a, a 10 kilowatt reactor. We need, you know, a megawatt, but. No, you got to start somewhere. Eventually, the right way to have power on Mars will be fission, but initially it'll prob probably be um, it'll it'll probably be solar. But in order to get the rockets back, we need a lot of power there to make propellant. Okay, here's another fun question: Does SpaceX have any protocols in place in case signs of previous life are found on Mars? I'm sorry, <laughs> I, didn't I didn't quite get that. Does SpaceX have any protocols in place in case signs of previous life are found on Mars? <laughs> um, well, NASA has protocols <laughs> um, for that, which we're, we're following initially. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we want to we go there and, um, you know, explore and, and, uh, and find... The signs of life. It, you know, it's very possible that there is life there. You know, probably microbes in the dirt, and there probably was a lot more when Mars was wet. So there probably be signs of of, of previous life. Um, I think Robert Zubrin explained it quite well that how overblown this, you know, not mixing the biology is. In that, when you know, one of these anthrax poisoning cases happened. They can tell exactly which lab that anthrax came from by by looking at the genes. So, if there's, if you're trying to to to, to tell, uh, you know, Earth life from Martian life, you look at the genes. It's going to be very easy to to determine that. So, uh, it's I think it's way overblown. But we want to do exploration first before we do colonization. And at that time, humans there are going to have a much much better a chance of, of digging up and finding where the life is. You know, if it, if it exists there, if it did exist, 
Um, I think the best way to do it is to put humans there. Um, in the meantime, they should be sending more robotic missions. I, th I think that uh, you know they should be doing ten times as many robotic missions as they're doing, and and and, and doing you know way more focused on trying to find life because I think that's a huge, really important uh, to answer. And I'm all for going to to Enceladus and finding life in those oceans. It, it looks like you know these um, ocean planets or ocean moons can support life. We need to go find out. You know. It's it's probably very. It, it'd be much easier to do that remote uh, uh, robotically to go to um, you know the the moons of uh, Jupiter or the moons of Saturn to look for life. So we need to send missions to to do that. Okay, so this is going to be our final question. Okay. Um, where is it? Oh, I lost it. Wait, hold on. Okay. <laughs> Many of us look up to you as a role model. Who do you find inspirational? Who do I find inspirational? <laughs> Elon, of course. Um, I mean, he's a, he's a huge influence on me. When when I left TRW, you know, I thought if if we fail, which was you know, which, which was, was at the time I thought was a high probability because nobody had ever done this, and uh, I thought. I'll just go back to TRW. So I, didn't, I didn't burn any bridges, but once I learned how he thought and how he operated, and be, I became an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, he influenced me so much that there's no way I could go back to working for a big bureaucratic company like like Northrop Grumman. So it was quite profound, and the way that I deal with um, with life, I, I think much differently now, just because of the Elon influence. I, I, uh, you know, I live a lot bigger. I make bolder decisions. I take higher higher risks, and uh, you know I'm not I'm not this conservative TRW engineer that I was when I first met Elon. I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, so I would say he's probably my biggest influence for sure. Very nice. Well, all of us are so excited that you called, and we just want to <laughs> say give a huge thank you. I don't know. If yeah. <laughs> thank you. I'm always glad to. To talk with fans, um, you know, as you know, I'm a I'm a member of the LA Astronomy Society. I'm hugely into astronomy. I always was as a kid. Um, I think I have one of these minds where I can. I mean, nobody can really fathom how big space is, but I'm one of the people, and I'm sure many of you are that way too, where I can fathom how unfathomable space is. And one of the things that always that I always thought about is every planet. And every moon we went to in the solar system was like a wow factor. There was just so much there, like just Pluto recently. There's so much more there than anybody ever thought. Imagine what's out in the universe, and other star systems, and uh, you know other galaxies. It's just you can't imagine. It's just it's incredible, and uh, it pains me that we are confined to Earth, and I'm trying to fix that as fast as I can. <laughs> yeah. In the meantime, we have nice pictures to look at for space. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Let's all give one giant round of applause. Again. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, and good luck to all of you. Yeah. And good luck on uh, your future launches and getting everyone to Mars. You know, thank you so much. You we, I really appreciate thank you. it. And Take you care. Yeah, obviously really appreciate it. So. Signing off. See ya. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh my God. You did yeah. it, I did it. I okay. can't believe we actually did that. All right, so um, I'm I just so wanted to thank you all for attending and participating in our events. Some of you guys might not actually know this, but I joined the club when I was a freshman and took over as president as a sophomore. At the time, it was completely run for, by our advisor. <laughs> you guys have taken class with her, Rosita Jones. Um, so when she turned it over to me, I kind of had to create a whole club organization. Sophomore. At the time, it was completely run by our. Hold on.